This is my grandfather, Roland Warnock. He was a real cowboy. Not a TV cowboy like Roy Rogers, but a real Texas cowboy. In 1915, he was 19 years old and working for Mr. Sam Lane on the Guadalupe Ranch. The Guadalupe was located in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, not far from the fabled King Ranch. And he told me this story. He said that during this time, he buried two men who were unarmed and shot in the back by Texas Rangers. One of the killers would later become the leader of the Texas Rangers. The Texas Rangers. They've been the heroes of dime novels, movies, and even a television series. This elite law enforcement agency is filled with colorful characters like Captain Bill McDonald, who it is said would charge hell with a bucket of water. He also first uttered that famous phrase, one riot, one ranger. But despite their glorious past and their present day accomplishments, a dark, unpleasant chapter that most people are not aware of took place in 1915 and 1916. It happened for just a brief time in South Texas while they were pursuing border bandits. My grandfather told me this story when I was a young child. It always intrigued me. For myself and the millions of baby boomers who grew up with the Lone Ranger, the thought of a Texas Ranger shooting an unarmed man in the back was not only unbelievable, but unthinkable. I mean, Texas Rangers were supposed to fight for justice. They fight and fight for right and justice to enforce the law for you. When I was a student at Baylor University, I got him to record his story in 1973 for Baylor's oral history program. 1913, 14, 15, 16. In fact, that fight went on all, all up and down Texas border, New Mexico and Arizona. Those bandits in that Mexican trouble, though, they come over here and steal horses and, and cattle and take them back to Mexico and, and sell them to the, the army over there. They were, they were soldiers with the cavalry, scattered all, all up and down the border country. They expected, expected to find, to find a, bandit a bandit behind, behind every bush. bush. And those Mexicans knew just how to get away from, from them. While they could lie down and watch those soldiers pass within 100 yards, those Mexicans played all around them. They would drop right in behind them, burn a ranch, steal some cattle. Now, when they brought the rangers in there, that stopped a lot of it. They killed lots of Mexicans and several innocent ones that I knew of. The rangers differed from the soldiers in that a soldier would yell halt and then shoot. The rangers shot and then yelled halt. It was just as rough as the Dickens there for several years. And the bad part was that I was right in the middle of it. In the summer of 1915, we were leaving out early one morning to gather some cattle that were 20 miles east of the main headquarters. There were five of us with 60 saddle horses. We passed in front of what is known as the McAllen Ranch. And there was a strong southeast wind blowing as we moved to the east. About the time that we passed this McAllen Ranch, there were 14 Mexican bandits who had come in to kill old man McAllen. McAllen's family lived in Brownsville, where they had a nice home. He stayed out of the ranch during the summertime, and had a Mexican woman cook and a girl there. This girl had come across the river looking for a safe place to hide from the revolution. He gave her a job to take care of the house during his absence and keep it clean when he was there. Now, naturally, this girl's parents back in Mexico did not care a lot about these living arrangements. I'm probably the only man alive today who knows this, but this was a contract killing. Those 14 Mexicans had been sitting in there by that girl's family to kill old man McAllen. 
but they went about it all wrong. They were the dumbest bunch I ever heard tell of. Now, they could have killed him with just one shot, but instead they rode right up to the headquarters and called out for McAllen. This woman went to the door and asked him in Spanish what they wanted. Their reply was, we want McAllen's head. She went back inside to where he was asleep, woke him up, told him what was out there. Of course, he got a little excited, but he had all kinds of ammunition, high-powered rifles, shotguns, and six shooters, because this trouble had been going on for some time. He went to the lattice work, stuck his gun through it, and blew a Mexican off his horse and killed him with the first shot. This Mexican woman ran to the window, grabbed him by the arm, and jerked him away and said, don't ever shoot but once from the same place, and then move away or they'll kill you, and now they're gonna kill me too. Well, she saved his life, no doubt about it, and he did what she told him to. He placed a gun by each window and moved around the house, shooting and moving from spot to spot. Each time he fired, those Mexicans would pepper the window, but he'd move on to another one and fire again. They shot from sun up until noon. He killed three horses and two men in front of the ranch. Finally, they rode away. But as they did, one of them hollered back, that's okay, we have 80 more men and we'll be back. Well, the old man took them for the word and he got up to leave the ranch. This Mexican woman begged him not to go, saying that if they really had any men, they would have brought them in the first place. But he left the ranch and wandered out into the brush. Sam Lane, the boss of our outfit, heard all this shooting. He knew there was trouble over there, but when we left the ranch that morning, we left only one man with him. And after we left, this man had to go to the lower part of the ranch to check on some windmills, and he wouldn't be back till two o'clock. Lane tried to phone the ranger station, but the bandits cut the line 56 times. The old man was ruptured pretty badly and couldn't ride a horse very long. But when this boy came back to the ranch, he put him on a fresh horse and sent him to the ranger station in Monte Cristo. Captain Ransom out of Houston had a ranger company there with nine rangers. The Mexicans who had raided the McAllen place had come out about 300 yards from the Guadalupe Ranch headquarters and stopped on a little knoll for a bit. Old Man Lane thought they were coming for him, but he was well prepared for them, and had they decided to come into his ranch, several of those old boys would have suffered because Lane was a good shot and was waiting for them. But they didn't come in, and he watched them right away. The rangers didn't get to the ranch until dark. They liked to never found old man McAllen, but they did and brought him back in and got what information they could from him and this Mexican woman. Old man Lane begged them to go onto the border and drop a man off at each crossing because he knew they would cross the river that night. It was a full moon and they would have no trouble seeing them. Now, Captain Ransom wasn't as familiar with that border country and he thought that the bandits would stop at some of the ranches in the area. What they had done was to ride over to a little Mexican farm about three miles from the Guadalupe headquarters. Those Mexican farmers took them in, dressed their wounds, and fed their horses. If they hadn't, the bandits would have killed them. The rangers finally decided to take Lane's advice and went back around Mission and up the river to Los Ibanos, a little village on the border. They got up there around four o'clock in the morning, and the only light they saw was an old Mexican woman living alone, sitting there drinking some coffee. They rode up in their Model Ts, and when they got out, this lady invited them in. She told them, the men you're looking for just crossed the river about 20 minutes ago. They can't be more than two miles from here. I gave them some coffee. There's only three of them that were still alive. One of them is in bad shape. He's sick, and another one's in bad shape too. One had his whole shoulder shot off, but there was one of them that wasn't hurt. The rest of them were on the road between here and the ranch either dead or dying. Well, they waited for daylight and tracked those wounded Mexicans by their bloody rags and horse tracks. And every man they found, they killed, drove off, and left them there. They got back to the Guadalupe Ranch about 11 or 12, and they had been out all night long. As soon as they ate some dinner, old man Lane threw them some blankets and pillows, and they spread out all over the porch and were asleep inside of 10 minutes. About one o'clock that afternoon, those Mexicans that had aided the bandits rode up to Lane's ranch and called him out. Now what was said between them, we never did know, but they turned and rode back to their farm. Captain Ranson recognized them, waited until they got about 300 yards from the headquarters, 
he got in the Model T with some other rangers and began to follow them. Well, these two Mexicans pulled over to the side of the road to let their car pass, and when they did, the rangers just shot them off their horses, turned around, went back to the ranch and back to sleep. About two days later, we could hardly sleep because of the stench. Human scent is the worst in the world. We went over there and found their bodies still lying where they had been shot. We buried them the morning of September 29th, 1915. Their graves are still there. There's a highway that goes through that part of the country, and they're on the right of way, marked. What had happened was the rangers had found some bloody rags at their place, and they killed them for lying to them. These Mexicans were afraid that if they told the rangers anything, the bandits would kill them. But if they hadn't helped the bandits, then the bandits would have killed them then. They were right in the middle of it and didn't know what to do. You felt sorry for a lot of those people. Now, these two men, one of them I knew real well, old Jesus Basson, he's a good old man. And, and he, he, he told them that lie because he was afraid. He was afraid to tell them the truth. He made some of them come back to kill him or kill his family. And none of that kind of stuff ever got in the papers. Uh, uh, about the rage and what happened and what was the cause of it, anything like that. Nobody ever investigated it uh, that I know anything about. Oh, there, there were, there's some dirty work going on with it. I wanted to find out about these men that the Rangers had killed. Who were they? Did they leave any family behind? I wondered if they had any descendants still living in the Rio Grande Valley. The dead men's names were Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria. Both of them were American citizens. Jesus Bazan was a 67-year-old man, a neighbor of Sam Lane of the Guadalupe Ranch and the McAllens. Antonio Longoria, far from being a banded sympathizer, was a certified school teacher by the Texas State Board of Education. He was also a United States postmaster and a deputy sheriff for Hidalgo County. The Bazan Ranch, unlike some of the other Hispanic-owned ranches, held a clear title to its land. In 1852, Don Bazan traveled to Austin to register his original Spanish land grant with the state. He resisted all efforts to sell his land and paid his property taxes. Despite following the letter of the law, Jesus Bazan and his son-in-law, Antonio Longoria, were shot in the back and left by the side of the road. The bodies were to lay as a warning to anyone showing sympathy for the banded cause. Today, their children and grandchildren still live in the Rio Grande Valley. Antonio Longoria's son, Beto Longoria, is a retired insurance agent in the town of Mission, Texas. Well, he was a deputy sheriff. He was. Uh postmaster. He was killed by the rangers, shot him in the back. My father was a peaceful man. He never was abandoned. It was a lie. Well, it irritates me to have to go through without a father all my life, because I was only one year old. Antonio Longoria's grandson, H.F. Longoria Jr., is an assistant attorney general for the state of Texas. In an ironic twist of fate, he is now working to uphold the laws of Texas, while his grandfather was killed by Texas law enforcement. I spent a lot of time with my grandmother when I was a child, and of course she used to tell me stories about the way the ranch living was in those days. One of the interesting stories that she used to tell me was about the death of my grandfather, that, uh, um, you know, that she was killed by the rangers, and, uh, and every time she, she would speak about that, she would get very emotional, and, and she would cry. The grandson of Jesus Bazan, the 67-year-old man shot by the Rangers, is Dr. John Bazan, a physician in the Rio Grande Valley city of Harlingen. Jesus Bazan was my great-grandfather. Uh, he was murdered by, a, uh, by the Texas Rangers. I, I believe that the, uh, the uh, Texas Rangers were to the Mexican American and Native Americans what the KKK was to the African Americans. And the only thing is that these guys were legal. 
The area where Brazan and Longoria died is near present-day Brownsville, Harlingen, and McAllen, Texas, and is known as the Lower Rio Grande Valley. Well, they always felt that this was their land, and it was. It was uh, colonized in the late 1740s by Colonel Jose Escondon. People are still amazed today, because, the, especially people who come from the north, because they got the idea that this land was like Kansas or Oklahoma, that it was filled with primitive, or you might say savage Indians, and it was there for the taking. And you have this picture of everybody lined up in stagecoaches ready to, to rush in. But this land for 150 years before America ever came into it was uh, owned by uh, Spain, and, and the land grants and the deeds go back to the king of Spain. This area is, is the area that was where Mexican were, uh, received land grants because you have to understand that this part was, n uh, was not part of Texas. Texas, the southern boundary of Texas was the Nueces River. It becomes part of um, Texas after the American War of Aggression against Mexico in 1848. So if someone already owned the land, how could Anglo settlers acquire it? One way was to purchase it from Hispanics who spoke no English and really did not comprehend what they were selling. They bought this land long ago, the Benedicts. They got it through purchase years ago. Bought it, they took it off a bunch of ignorant Mexicans. Why, that's not true, Jim. They bought and traded for Spanish land grants. Paid for all right. They paid five cents an acre. Another way was a new procedure that many Mexican-Americans were unfamiliar with, the property tax. One of the ways that uh, mostly is uh, what they call tax sales, and that is that people didn't pay their taxes. Uh, and so they were taken over by the sheriff for non-payment of taxes and then, and then uh, sold. Yes, if, if people couldn't pay uh, the taxes on their land lots of times, the notice was posted on the courthouse door and certain individuals would acquire land that way by buying it for a, a, on a tax sale deed. A lot of them didn't read English or were not literate at all. And there were unscrupulous people that took advantage of that. The notices were often posted on the inside of the door and the doors would open exactly at eight and then they'd close at five. So unless you wanted to look behind an open door, it's against a wall, you wouldn't see it. A map of the area shows the change. In 1910, almost all of Hidalgo County was owned by Hispanics. By 1920, the land had been transferred to Anglo speculators who had subdivided it for sale to out-of-state buyers. If land could not be bought or seized in a tax sale, a more extreme way was to simply label the Hispanic landowner as a bandit and kill him. You had kind of a two-stage transformation. You had, first of all, uh, a major shift in land holding from primarily Hispanic ranches to Anglo ranches. And beyond that, you had an amazing transformation from ranch land to commercial agriculture. This was like the last frontier. Land development was, had become a high business art in America. The land development became more and more of a real razzle-dazzle business with uh, super lawyers and uh, super salesmen hard sell. They brought train loads of people from the Midwest down here. They told them that, it, you know, you get 366 days of sunlight and you got this powerful river running through here. And so within 10 years, from 1905 to 1915, the, the land was gobbled up in one way or another by these land development companies who parceled it off to these Midwesterners. One of these land developments was a place called Monte Cristo. It was built by the Mulatto Land Company by John Hammond, an investor from Houston. My great-grandfather, Frank Warnock, was hired to maintain the irrigation pumps and a cotton gin. This would have tragic consequences later on. They went back to uh, Midwestern states like Kansas and Iowa and Minnesota with their salesmen and found already prosperous farmers. They didn't bring somebody down unless they knew they were uh, already successful. And for a, a small price or no fee, they bring them down on trains and wind them and dine them down here. They took them to what were called land party houses. 
And then they drove them around to look at farms, always good farms, thriving farms, and convinced them that they could have three crops a year and they didn't have to shovel snow. As the Anglo newcomers streamed in and the native Hispanics lost their property, the resentment simmered and grew. So then in the space of a generation, many uh, vaqueros, which was a very, um, which was a, a, a class of, uh, or a, a type of individual very well respected along the border, who may have started off, off his young life, as a young adulthood as a vaquero, by the end of his adulthood would be uh, employed in stoop labor, picking uh, commercial uh, agricultural crops. The um, Mexican-American young men would get together at night in their porches outside, and they would hear their parents, if not their grandparents, talking about the old days when they owned the land. And then they would hear how the, they had lost the land, how the land had been taken away from them. And all these stories were being told over and over uh, uh, to this new young generation. Um, and so they desired to get back the land that was theirs. The land had been taken from them mostly extra legally rather than legally. And that's what social revolutions are made of. So of course, there was the Mexican Revolution, which spread well into this, to, to this state and along the border on both sides, of course. In addition to that, you had the presence of large numbers of U.S. troops in response to the so-called bandit war. By 1917, um, uh, you had about 85 percent of all U.S. troops poised along the, the Texas-Mexican border. Uh, so you had an incredible war zone mentality there. The point here is, within 10 years, this land was, uh, for the most part, slipped away from them, and the people were very upset. 1915 was the peak year of the bandit era, what we call, we try to call it the bandit era, but we don't know who were these bandits. They might have been guys from Mexico. They just wanted to get across the river till the revolution ended, you know, and then they didn't know the language, they didn't know the culture, and then they got hungry and they wrote, robbed a loaf of bread. Immediately, they're a, they're a, a bandit, right? First of all, you know, no, there's no such thing as a, it's a bandit war. Anglo historians refer to it uh, as, a, as, the, uh, as the bandit war because that's really the only way that, that, that they can uh, apologize for the actions that took place by the Anglo community upon the Mexican community in uh, 1915, which was um, a mass murdering of Mexican-Americans. My research suggests that about 5,000 Mexican-Americans were murdered during this period. And I'm talking about families, people being accused of being a, a bandit or supporting banditry, and you were just shot, killed. And so the only way you can um, justify that historically to the next generations is by saying, well, they were bandits. By 1915, the discovery of bodies of Mexican-Americans in the Rio Grande Valley was so commonplace that the San Antonio Express declared that it would no longer report on it. Postcards of some of the victims were even made. As a boy who grew up as a Lone Ranger, I want to know what kind of men these Rangers were. The men who were in the car that day were Texas Ranger Captain Henry Ransom, Ranger Paul West, and the driver, W.W. W. Bill Sterling. No one can say with certainty which of these men pulled the trigger and ended the lives of Antonio Longoria and Jesus Bazan. Unlike the popular Hollywood portrayal of Texas Rangers being sworn in during a solemn ceremony to uphold the laws of the state of Texas. Thousands of political contributors to the governor's campaign fund received special ranger appointments. The special rangers were, were uh, sort of an auxiliary at that time, but again, it was, they were, uh, or the, the concept was abused politically, which of course is a both good and bad news. I mean, it, it, it provided a good function in a way, but on the other hand, it was wide open to to abuse by unscrupulous individuals who wanted to, in effect, pose as, as being a real Texas Ranger. What, what constituted the Texas Rangers in that decade is very uh, unclear. By about 1918, there was many as a thousand people running around the valley calling themselves Rangers. Most of them, oh, about 900 of them, were special Rangers. And those were appointed by the governor who served, uh, men that served with no pay, could be political cronies, could be prominent ranchers, or and sometimes those two uh, overlapped, of course. Uh, could be uh, just darn near anybody that somebody vouched for who somebody knew somewhere. 
Um, and this put the stamp of authority uh, on many of these uh, vigilante actions. One of these special rangers was Bill Sterling. Gentlemen, attached is my application for my special ranger commission. I have kept the peace for some time and am the only American living in western Hidalgo County. Signed, W.W. W. Bill Sterling. This may have come as a surprise to the hundreds of Americans of Hispanic descent who had been living there. Among the ranks of these newly appointed rangers was Henry Ransom, a former Houston police chief who had been dismissed after he shot and killed a local defense attorney in open court. He later assaulted a newspaper reporter he felt had been unfairly critical of him. Before his tenure in Houston, he served in the U.S. Army during the Philippine insurrection where he learned to torture Muslim rebels. Henry Ransom, he was uh, characterized primarily as being a thug, uh, a man who had murdered in Houston and murdered on the prison walls in Huntsville uh, prior to be being appointed by James Ferguson, governor of Texas, as a ranger captain. Mr. Ferguson, according to a story by um, a prominent South Texas rancher, in the testimony in the Canales investigation, Ferguson told him, he said, well, listen, I don't care what all these people keep saying about Ransom and all the things he's been doing down there. I don't care if he kills every last one of them. This troubled nest down there has been going on long enough. I sent him down there to clean it up. If he has to kill every one of them to do it, that's okay with me. I'll pardon him when I get the chance. When questioned about his methods, he once said that a bad disease calls for bitter medicine. It got to the point almost where anybody who looked like he might be a bandit was a fair target. People shot first and asked questions afterwards. It's not something I, I think that people would like to put into history books because it, it really was a pretty ugly story for a while. But the point of the matter is that but a bandit was anybody with dark skin to most of these people in the valley. It was very convenient to label a bandit by an ethnic badge, that is to say, dark hair and dark skin. There are many, many accounts of innocent um, Mexican and Mexican-American folks being shot down or tortured uh, because they were, could be labeled as a bandit. It was a very uh, real concern there in South Texas that, you know, world forces were trying to, to take part of Texas. And, uh, you know, we're kind of partial to Texas and don't want to lose it now that we got it. And, and uh, I, I think that was part of the sentiment that I, I believe that they felt they were, in a way, fighting a war, that they were sort of refighting the, the Texas Revolution uh, one more time. And Webb defends uh, an action by the rangers that he calls revenge by proxy, uh, meaning that if, there, if, if there's a suspected thief in the area and you can't find him, you just shoot another person, and that person becomes the proxy thief. Well, this is a, a ridiculous uh, defense of illegal activity by a law enforcement agency. Those that went down there, they really committed sins, uh, not to the magnitude in the millions of what, uh, say, the Nazis did, but certainly in the thousands. And there's plenty of evidence for that. There was even the sort of derogatory term that they would use, uh, or some of them would use to say that, well, you know, I killed uh, 14 men and I'm not counting Mexicans. I mean, you know, again, something that nobody could even say today. I think for some of them, it was no different than shooting a, a coyote. Most Texans would find it hard to conceive of a ranger doing something like this, but I knew my grandfather was telling the truth. I wanted to find some evidence to support his story. Was Roland Warnock's story correct? Would a Texas ranger shoot a 67-year-old man in the back and leave him by the side of the road? What about his charge that the bandit raid was really a revenge killing? Was there a young girl living on the McAllen Ranch? To verify this story, we searched for anything we could find on the Texas Rangers to see if there was some other account of this incident. We started with Walter Prescott Webb's book, The Texas Rangers. It remains one of the best-selling titles for the University of Texas Press. Webb's book was uh, written in a period when Texas was really celebrating its Anglo history, and that's the key word, Anglo history. Webb's a, the most reputable historian Texas has ever produced. 
Uh, and this book was one of the important books in, early in his career, but the book doesn't hold up very well today. It's still widely read. It's still regarded by a lot of people, by the general population, as sort of the authoritative work on the Texas Rangers. That book w could not be published today. It, it, it might not even be self-publishable today by today's standards. And, you know, you can just almost call it racist in the way it uh, talks about uh, uh, people on the border. It was a life of the saints. But uh, use, uh, the UT Texas Press is a university press. And the book that countered the Texas Rangers was Américo Paredes' With His Pistol in His Hand, which also shows uh, how underhanded and, uh, and how, well, how ill the Mexican-Americans were treated. He says some harsh things, but his uh, is a very different book. He writes about the myth and the legend, and he labels it as such. But then the second part of the book are the historical facts. Uh, and Walter Webb, of course, uh, was writing of the life of the saints, and he glorified them. And as many of the kids here in Texas uh, were raised at the Texas Rangers, you know, that old, what was that, one ranger, one riot? There's no mention of Captain Henry Ransom or the killings of Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longorio in Webb's book. However, Bill Sterling provides his account in Trails and Trials of a Texas Ranger, his autobiography. Sterling rose to the rank of adjutant general, the highest rank in the ranger force. Bill Sterling's story was similar to Roland Warnock's, but he left out the killing of Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria and leaving their bodies by the side of the road. There was also no mention of the young Mexican girl in the McAllen ranch house. Because he rather proudly admitted that he was driving the car that carried Ransom and two of his men, it is understandable why Sterling would omit the shootings of Bazan and Longoria. There is nothing romantic or ranger-like about shooting unarmed men in the back. Robert Draper of Texas Monthly took a critical look at the reality and the mythology of the Texas Rangers in his cover story. I've been with Texas Monthly for seven years and have published about 70 stories in that period of time. Uh, none of those stories comes close in terms of uh, uh, touching a nerve uh, the way that this story did. In addition to that, uh, there was one letter that indicated uh, that uh, uh, I hope you don't die anytime soon. I don't think you'll have enough friends to carry your casket for you. People do not always want balance. They don't always want fairness. They don't always want the facts. They want adulation. The matter of the Texas Rangers is a very complicated issue. So where did we get the idea that Rangers don't shoot people in the back? from the same place that most people get their Texas Ranger history. Hollywood, which gave us the Lone Ranger, Walker Texas Ranger, and Lonesome Dove. The Texas Rangers uh, were the basis for dime novels, uh, these cheap paperback books that were written uh, back in the 19th century. And Texas Ranger was a hero before the cowboy. So when the movie makers started making westerns, the Texas Rangers afforded them an instant supply of plot, material, stories, and information. Uh, I think in the, the 1920s alone, for example, there were about 40, 41, 42 Texas Ranger movies. The Ranger was a man on horseback, a man with a gun, and a man who was supposed to be on the side of law and order and who would go out and perform good deeds and uh, be heroic. And uh, Hollywood uh, seized upon this figure that had already had a reputation as being on the side of light, truth, civilization, justice, the American way. And uh, people apparently responded to the stories of the Rangers they, uh, because they kept making them. You asking me as a captain or a preacher, Sam? I'm asking you as a Ranger of the sovereign state of Texas. Good morning, sir. Who are you? Captain Rogers, Texas Rangers. I thought I could help your men with that wheel. Thank you. The cavalry can take care of itself. All right, now you just get on right over that car. Oh. Well, now, look here. We're in the custody of Captain Frank Ham. And uh, Frank here is a Texas Ranger. Sure enough, he is. Hey there, peacemaker. I believe you got your spurs all tangled up there, haven't you? Huh? Probably the single most important purveyor of the Ranger legend was the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger, for example, alone implanted this idea in the minds of millions of, uh, of uh, radio listeners, a whole generation during the Depression, then on TV and so on. The Lone Ranger is still uh, a, sort of an icon in popular culture. No reason other than his commitment to the principle of justice. 
While the Rangers got great press in Hollywood, portrayals of Mexicans in the movies was something different. You know, the mountain police. If you're the police, where are your badges? Badges? We ain't got no badges. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. So what would cause a Texas Ranger to shoot an unarmed 67-year-old man in the back? First, let's go back for a brief history lesson. In 1836, the Republic of Texas was created after winning its independence from Mexico. The new country was still wild and untamed, with most of the population living in San Antonio and Galveston. To the west lay a vast frontier, inhabited by the fierce Comanches and Apaches, tribes noted for their ferocity in battle and their refusal to be herded onto reservations. To protect settlers on the Texas frontier, Stephen F. Austin authorized the formation of the Texas Rangers. Early Rangers were hardened frontiersmen, men who had served as scouts, Indian fighters, or buffalo hunters. They had to be able to live off the land and carry on a running fight with Indians. They were only paid $25 a month. They provided their own weapons and horses. The Republic of Texas paid for all their ammunition. Because frontier skills were a necessity, the governor appointed men who had these attributes to the ranger force. By 1881, the Texas Indians had been completely defeated. With the Indians removed, there was no longer a threat to Texas settlers. By 1915, there were no Indians to fight and no frontier in Texas. This marked a turning point because the rangers quit tracking Indians and became an interior police force. Frontier skills were no longer a requirement for service. The world and Texas were changing. In those years between 1881 to 1915, Texas went from the kerosene lamp to the electric light, from the horse to the automobile and airplane, and from the revolver to the automatic pistol. The Rangers also changed, going from frontier fighters to products of political patronage. The power of the governor to appoint Rangers remained intact and was now used to reward campaign supporters. I tried to contact the McAllen family about what they knew about this story. They made their position pretty clear in a series of letters. Argyle McAllen called it a bunch of crap and said that I was spreading misinformation. I'm not trying to disrespect their family. I'm just trying to tell another side of the story and let people decide for themselves. Argyle McAllen was also a one-year-old boy living in Brownsville with his mother when this raid occurred, so he doesn't provide any eyewitness testimony. But to check out his claim that everything was in the Ranger reports, I went to examine them at the Lorenzo Zavala Library in Austin. Captain Ransom's report from that day only says that he was in the area of the McAllen Ranch and he scouted to the Los Cibanos Crossing, just like my grandfather said. But his report makes no mention of the killings of Bazan and Longoria, and neither does it say anything about who was in the McAllen Ranch House. The modern-day concept of writing an offense report, uh, as far as I've ever been able to tell, did not exist in this era. I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is about all they would, did, um, would do. I've seen things where they, as uh, uh, brief as saying, uh, you know, run up on two cattle rustlers, uh, expense to state, eight rounds. No death certificates were filed for Bazan and Longoria, even though they were American citizens. Officially, these deaths never happened. So without any clarification in Captain Ransom's report, the next item disputed by the McAllen family remains. Was there a young Mexican girl living on the ranch with Mr. McAllen as Roland Warnock alleged? Was this entire bandit raid merely a case of a family trying to extract revenge? My name is Diorica McAllen Perez. My father was Willie McAllen. According to this birth certificate, the young girl living in the McAllen Ranch House was named Santos Tijarina. She gave birth to a son, Willie McAllen. The birth certificate says that Willie's father was James B. McAllen. I know that when she was 20 years old, she lived at um, Santa Anita Ranch, and she lived in the 
same uh, house where James uh, Mc Bayi McAllen lived. Today, the McAllen Ranch is rich with oil and gas wells. So it wasn't too surprising that when Diorica McAllen contacted her newly found family, she wasn't exactly welcomed with open arms. Well, I, all these years I've been wondering from why is my last name McAllen? I have tried to contact them just one time. I made a phone call and uh, the secretary said that she would give him the message, but I have not received it. I approached her with my father's birth certificate and she just looked and saw it for a minute and she said, you're not in the books and she turned away from me. Sir, I want to know where my roots are. Why is my last name McAllen? I've always wondered why. Is this girl really the granddaughter of the young girl in the house with Mr. McAllen? Only a DNA test would prove it conclusively. This is the house where my sister was born, Santos McKellen, back in 1957. This is a little shack. My father and my mother used to live here when my sister was born. Well, we have very humble beginnings, and well, I'm proud to be a McAllen. Of the three men in the car that day, Bazano and Goria were killed, Bill Sterling has enjoyed a unique place among Texas Rangers because of his book, Trails and Trials of a Texas Ranger. In it, Sterling wrote that he never killed a man during his ranger service. While he didn't kill anyone as a ranger, did he kill one and possibly three people prior to his appointment as a special ranger? Just two days after the killings of Bazana Longoria, Bill Sterling and his brother Ed shot and killed Roland Warnock's father, Frank Warnock, on the streets of Mission, Texas. Here's what happened. Uh, John Hammond, the owner of the, uh, the Madeline Land Company, told Papa when he was working for the Madeline Land Company, he said, now Frank, if you go in and, and plant and make that yard uh, a show place of the country. He said, I'll furnish you the water. It won't cost you anything as long as you live there. Two-inch line that came into the house. I think Hammond had been out of uh, an expense on it and no no, no returns on their money. And so he, he let those sterling have that 24,000 acres to get what they could out of it. They still agreed to pay Papa his salary to take care of that machinery. They had a lot of machinery invested there, pumps, engines, and so forth. Well, when they got mad at Papa over this gin business, but they wanted him to work there one night. After one night, he'd run the gin, and he was about three o'clock in the morning, and the gin broke down. They only liked two or three bales of cutting and finishing, but Papa told him then, he said, well, I'm just give out. And he said, this, this, it's gonna take about two hours and a half to, to fix this. And he said, I just, I'm so tired, I don't feel like, he said, let's just shut it down, and, and, uh, and we'll fix it in a little while in the morning. And the old man started and they wanted to go to Brown the next day and they wanted to gin that cotton that night. They said, no, we did it tonight. Papa just pitched some keys. They said, well, gin it then. And they couldn't figure it. There wasn't any of them. That made them mad. You know, that started the ball rolling. And Papa quit the outfit. He'd been working with them a long time. But he, 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 he was already, there was already a sore spot there because it was dark. Sterling was uh, overbearing and, and there's really this outfit now. So he, when he came in that night, and Mama told him they're out of water and says, we've been out all day. He went up the line to check the pipeline to see what was wrong and he found where they'd been taking it up. Boy, that made him mad. So he just went up there with the windshield and waited there the next morning to, until they come back there to pick it up. Just sat there and waited for them. And when they come, uh, he asked him what they, what they meant. He said, well, we have orders to take it out. Well, he said, you go back and tell those long ladies, some of which to come down here and take it out themselves if they want to. He said, and you start in right now to putting it back. But old Otto Woods, he's not scared him to death, but old Frank Live, he said, well, we, we were set up here, he said, to take this out, and old some bitch like you gonna t gonna stop us. And he just talked to when he should have been listening because Paul was always very full of lab. He just shot him, killed him, did. Right there. Well, of course, old, old Otto Woods, he went up there, you know, just fast he could, scared to death, and told him what Papa said. Well, they thought, you know, and he, they thought he meant business then. 
The Sterling brothers saw their chance to get even when Warnock came to town on October 2nd, 1915. He was unarmed. Oh, well, about middle that afternoon, he and I walked down in town together. We haven't been in mission, neither one of us has been in mission a long time. I haven't been down there, I don't know where. And we run into some men we knew, there right in front of the old Hay Salmon hardware store. Oh, uh, Jeffries, Harry Jeffries for one. Cunningham and, and Harry Jeffries was two of them. Well, we stand there talking to them. We was all four just standing in that shape. And they hadn't more than made about three steps, just big long steps. They come out of there and they come both of them come around this corner here with guns in their six automatics in their hand. Well, it was done so quick that I didn't have time to warn Father, but he didn't have he didn't have a gun on anyway. They emptied their guns. They put nine bullets in his back. He never did know what to, he never did. He just fell right across in front of me. And when he did, this bullet hit me. I thought then they were trying to kill me. And I, I don't know what they were because they followed me home. Mom was in iron in a shirt. And I said, I asked Mom, I knew we had a 10 gauge shotgun there and it was, Papa always kept it loaded with buckshot. And I asked Mama where it was. And she said, it's not at home. And she wanted to know what the trouble was. If I'd ever got my hand on that shotgun there, I'd have met him. She says, I'm going up there to him, and I begged her not to go then, but she went anyway. And she met him when she left the, left the house and started up the street there. <clears throat> they, they, they didn't bother her, but they, they, they came right on by and came by the house. Well, I, I still didn't have a gun. But I sit there in the front door and watch them pass. They just uh, had they got out and come in, they kill me. I didn't have any protection because I didn't have a gun. I couldn't find probably a shotgun. But that's what I've always blamed myself for that. Because they had killed an Anglo, a death certificate was filed. Bill and Ed Sterling were arrested for murder. The arresting officer was Ranger Captain Henry Ransom. Bill Sterling's bail was paid by Mr. James B. McAllen. It was a pretty slick outfit. They, they were, it was, it was handled pretty slick. And my evidence cleared them. My evidence alone cleared them. They, they put a, they put a spy in to find out, we thought he was our friend, they, but to find out what we were going to swear on the stand. He goes back and tells him everything that uh, he told the Sterlings and the Sterling lawyers just what was going on, they knew, knew exactly what we were going to swear. Uh, Papa had the habit of standing, when he was standing talking to anyone, he had a habit of uh, standing with his arms stuck under there like that. And that's the way he was standing, right there. He didn't have a gun on, but he had his hand there. All right, that was all they wanted, you see, to find out what, how I was going to swear. Then they got on there and swore that he was trying to get a gun out of his shirt. They, was, they swore that he's try, trying to go in on self-defense, that he was going to, well, it wasn't self-defense. Hell, he never did see him at all. The jury was home 18 hours, and they called me back. The jury come out then and called me back on the stand and asked me to repeat just how Papa had his arms. And I told him, I said, he had his hand under here, just like that. Well, that there is still, they claim, you see, they knew I was going to swear that, and they claim that he's trying to go into his shirt here and get a gun. And, and that, that, whenever they went back in there, the jury turned loose. For a long time, I couldn't sleep at night. I could see that just as plain as yesterday. That's been 45 years ago. I don't, uh, I don't, but I don't know. It just kind of seemed like it kind of tired me up to, yeah. to uh, go back over. It just don't do any good anymore. Right next door to Baylor University in Waco, you'll find the Texas Ranger Museum and Hall of Fame. Inside it, you'll find a nice display about Bill Sterling. He, he was quite a politician. He got in as a Ranger captain. Oh, as all you see headlines everywhere, and pictures of Bill Sterling, this, that, and the other, what they did, Ranger did this and that and the other. 
And then after Ross Sterling went in there, he made out a general out of it. He, he wrote a book. The book was on the Texas Ranger. I read the book. And you'd think he's sprouting wings in that book. But uh, oh, a lot of it he said in there was true, but a lot of it, a lot of it is just we and our name was never mentioned or that kill it. The best thing about that book is that um, its biases are transparent. Uh, I, I don't think any rational individual could read that and fail to detect uh, uh, what Sterling was up to. The main impression I have of Bill Sterling's book is that it is very selective and very self-serving portrayal of whatever events he just chooses to describe. Eighty-five years later, the pain of the bandit war is still felt. We can't stand much self-reflection since we see ourselves as perfect, and Lord knows we're not. So whenever uh, an institution such as the Rangers uh, is attacked, then they take it as a personal attack on them. They prefer to believe what they saw on the five cent movies on Saturday afternoons and the myths. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Well, it irritates me to have to go through without a father all my life. But I would have liked to see injustice to find out why it was done, because in our hearts and our mind, we know that my father was a peaceful man. He was denied having his dad at such a very young age. He never got to see his daddy because of uh, what these men did. I really don't know what was going through the Rangers' mind, but they made a mistake, and they've never admitted it. The truth has to come out, whether it hurts or not. But it'll never bring those 5,000 men and women who were killed, shot, burned, hanged, just because they were Texas Mexicans. We are not a defeated people. We survived, and we have survived all this time and, and, and continue to. And we're in the process of actually being the victors of the end because um, uh, we're about to become the majority of the people of Texas. This story that we've, we've been seeing in this documentary uh, is inspired in part by the tale a grandfather told a grandson about something he witnessed. Imagine how much more powerful that story is to a grandson hearing a story about his grandfather being killed. And imagine multiplying that by hundreds, if not thousands of times. Because for the decade 1910 to 1920, there were no doubt thousands of outrages along the lines of innocent Mexicans being slain by Texas Rangers, other local officers, or by outraged posses who were inspired by the lawlessness of the Rangers themselves. So I think it's important that we set the record straight, that the official denial that has gone on in the textbooks and the official stories about the state of Texas be called what it was, a big lie. And that we come to understand that what has been a very unifying symbol for much of Anglo-Texas has been a very divisive one if we look at Texans as a whole. Texas is big enough, the time has come for us to admit to our faults, acknowledge what happened, and move on. In 1917, just two years after the killings of Bizano Longoria, Ranger Captain Henry Ransom was killed in a hotel in Sweetwater, Texas. He was found dead in his room in his nightshirt. He had been shot while he slept. His killer was never found. After Bill and Ed Sterling killed his father, Roland Warnock left the Rio Grande Valley. He moved to Fort Stockton, Texas, where he started a small ranch and began a 35-year career with the Texas Highway Department. Warnock Road near Fort Stockton and Warnock Park on Highway 385 were named in his honor. He died in 1976. Bill Sterling went on to become Adjutant General of Texas, the highest position in the Texas Rangers. He resigned in 1935, shortly after Governor Miriam Ferguson took office. He died in 1960. His grave is in Corpus Christi. In 1965, the Texas Historical Commission placed a historical marker on Sterling's grave. At the dedication, the featured speaker said that Bill Sterling was a person who never killed another man in his entire ranger service. He helped make the borderlands safe. There is no historical marker on the graves of Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria. Esperado, regresa tu padecer, 
te has alejado de tu gente mucho tiempo ya. Eres un terco, pero tú tienes razones. El dolor que tú sientes nunca te dejará. No te metas con la reina de oro, pues te engaña en un instante. La reina de corazones te amará. Hasta hoy ella siempre te ha dado el amor que tú mereces, pero tú no sabes decidir. Te Estás en un rinconcito Con un dolor y una sed No eres libre pero piensas Que vivirás para siempre Te ambiciona tu mente En este mundo feroz El viento en invierno sopla Duro en tu destino Quisieras que los días pasen ya No te importa si te sientes mal O si lloras por la noche Aún no quieres regresar Desesperado Regresa a tu padecer Regresa Ablanda tu corazón Quizás llueva pero sabes Que saldrá el arco iris Deja que el amor te llene Antes de morir